Hi, welcome to another devlog for the droid colony building game I'm working on. In the previous video I talked about the game prototype, which I was pretty happy with, so I went straight ahead and started working properly on the actual game. As before, I started with the voxel terrain. In the prototype I stored the whole map in a single three-dimensional array and rendered it basically without any optimizations. However, I want the game to feature infinite procedurally generated terrain, like in a certain well-known game. So I used the standard approach of storing the terrain in chunks. In my case, I settled on cubical chunks of size 32 by 32 by 32 blocks. Now, even with some cool procedural generation, voxel terrains may look a bit repetitive, and I know that the project won't have enough content to remedy that in the early stages. The solution I came up with is to use a global noise texture that lightens or darkens the terrain a bit. A single global texture is still repetitive though, albeit in a much larger scale. To fix that, I use the following trick. When rendering a pixel of the terrain at a certain position in the world, I use this position as the texture coordinate to sample the noise texture, and I also multiply the position by some irrational number to sample the texture at a different point, and then combine the results. Since this number is irrational, the resulting pattern never actually repeats. I'm showing a 2D texture here, but I'm actually using a 3D texture of the size 128 pixels in each dimension. This method might sound a bit overcomplicated, but the code for this in the shader is really quite simple and fast, so I'm happy with that. Right now, the terrain is only lit by some ambient light and a fixed directional light source, the sun. However, I'm planning to have many more light sources in the game, so from the very beginning I implemented something called Deferred Shading. It is a relatively old and well-known method for rendering a scene with a ton of light sources, and it is still used even by some AAA games. It works by first rendering the scene to a set of textures, commonly referred to as the G-buffer. They contain the scene albedo, also known as color, normals, material properties and whatever else you need to compute lighting. Sometimes the G-buffer also contains the world space position of pixels, but it is trivial to reconstruct from the depth buffer, so I don't store it explicitly. Then the contribution of each light source on each pixel is computed using the data from the G-buffer and added to the final result. Next, I proceeded to generating something more interesting than a single hard-coded hill. I had this idea in mind of a large desert with slowly varying heights and occasional tall stone cliffs sticking out of ground. I achieved this by using three separate parallel noise maps with different scales. One has its control points in a square grid every 128 blocks, and controls the large, low-frequency height changes. Another has the scale of 16 blocks and controls small, high-frequency height variation. The third one has control points every 64 blocks and governs the location of cliffs. I sample the value of the cliff noise map and feed it into two interpolating curves that tell me the vertical scale of the two height maps. And the result looks like this. Terrain generation is currently quite slow, so it is done in background threads. Of course, I spent a lot of time tweaking these noise maps and interpolation curves, and honestly, the result is not bad for the first attempt. Now, the cliffs are nice, but it still looks a bit fake without some basic atmosphere, so I added a simple distance fog and a sky. The sky is just a gradient between two fixed colors, and the color at the horizon matches the color of the fog, creating a really nice visual effect. One problem with the sky is that with this simple gradient you can actually see the points where pixels change color. I amplified the effect so that it is clearly seen in the video. This is not a bug. It's how human color perception works. We can differentiate more colors than our screens can show, especially so in the darker areas. This is not a huge problem, but there is a relatively simple fix. Use dithering. By applying an ordered dithering mask after the whole scene is rendered to a high precision color buffer, the problem magically goes away. You can still spot it if you look really close, but otherwise the color bending is almost unnoticeable. All this time I was slightly bothered by how the terrain looks. You see, for a single block a directional light source can only affect three of its faces simultaneously. The other three faces should only receive ambient light. However, if I remove the ambient light, the terrain still appears lit from all directions, 
It turned out that my terrain normals were wrong, and always pointed to the direction where all the coordinates were positive. Incidentally, this is also the general direction, where the sun was. So I fixed it, and yeah, much better. But now we have another problem. If we approach one of the cliffs from the unlit side, it is really hard to understand its geometry, because all the surfaces from this side only receive ambient light and have the same color. The fog and the noise texture do help a bit, but the problem still exists. The typical way to solve this is to use ambient occlusion, which is a fancy name for the technique of darkening the areas of the scene that have some concave corners. Some voxel engines do this by pre-computing this darkening for each vertex. I decided to try a different well-known method called Screen Space Ambient Occlusion, or SSAO, which doesn't require pre-computation and doesn't depend on the actual terrain geometry, meaning if I add some other, non-voxel objects to the world, the method will still work. The result looks like this, and I think it's way better. The geometry of the terrain is quite obvious now. At this point I realized that it's a bit awkward that the sun shines over the whole map, but it isn't visible, so I hard-coded a little circle with a halo to the sky rendering shader. Since I'm planning the game to be quite heavy on rendering, and the terrain occupies most of the screen all the time, it should be well optimized. I'm already doing the basic optimization of not rendering block faces which are invisible due to being obstructed by a neighboring block, but this is not nearly enough. Right now I'm rendering each block's face as a separate square composed of two triangles, which is far from optimal. There are many large flat regions that can be rendered as a single large rectangle. So I implemented something called greedy remeshing. When generating the mesh of a particular terrain chunk, I traverse its slices along x, y and z directions, and I try to fill each slice with rectangles. For each unfilled square, I create a new rectangle and draw it until it can no longer be enlarged. This was a huge improvement, having less triangles increases rendering performance, because there are less vertices to be processed by the GPU, and it also drastically decreases the amount of GPU memory used by the terrain. Going back to the lighting, there is always the problem of color saturation. Basically, when a point is lit by many light sources, their contributions add up and the resulting color may be brighter than the maximal value representable by the screen. This isn't a problem right now, since I don't have any light sources apart from the sun, but it has to be dealt with in advance, so that I won't have to tweak all the colors again later in the development. This is typically solved by something called tone mapping, which simply remaps all the possible color values to the 0-1 range. I used the classic Reinhardt tone mapping, which also supports changing the average brightness of the scene. The colors look a bit washed out now, because tone mapping compresses the bright colors a bit, but it's fine, I actually like it better. Finally, I decided that it's time to add some basic physics. I started with the simplest case of point particles and implemented gravity and terrain collisions for them. I created these simple black particles to test it, and it seems to work fine. There is a small problem, though. The particles eventually stop bouncing and slide on top of the terrain, with their vertical coordinate being exactly equal to the top coordinate of the blocks, which confuses the collision algorithm in such a way that the particles can sometimes slide through blocks. Now, this isn't a huge problem, since I'm only planning to use this collision code for things like bullets, which don't bounce and are not affected by gravity, so I just left it as it is. Next, I implemented collisions for the player. It uses a cylinder collider, as in the prototype, but I treat it as a box when computing terrain collisions for now, just because the code is a bit simpler this way. Currently, the player moves rather slowly, which is intended, you'll be able to make some upgrades later in the game. However, after wandering around these clips for a while, I realized that it would be a nightmare to test this game like this, so I added a jetpack. Well, it's not really a jetpack, there is no explicit jetpack item in the game, there is no model and so on. It's just a hard-coded force that accelerates you forward and a little bit upward. I created this as a testing and debugging tool, but <laughs> it turned out to be really fun. I cannot stress how many hours I've spent just doing this. 
that's it for today's devlog. If you enjoyed it, like, subscribe, comment, do all the YouTube things and I see you next time.